I'm Councillor Will Pascal, the committee chair, and I'd first like to apologise to everybody for a slightly rickety start. Um, this meeting has been held in accordance with the recent government regulations on virtual meetings. Please bear with us if we run into some technical challenges during the meeting as we adapt to these new ways of working. Well, we've had a few at the beginning of the meeting, so apologies for that. In line with government guidance that everyone should stay at home as much as possible, this meeting has been held by Microsoft Teams, live conferencing, and all the committee members, council officers, and the parties who wish to participate in this hearing are joining from remote locations. Now, the event is being streamed live and members of the public and media are welcome to follow the meeting remotely and listen to the discussions taking place. Um, I would ask people to make sure that they're except when they're speaking, that their microphones and uh, cameras are turned off and also pay attention to not using the chat for anything other than raising uh, the, the fact that you wish to speak. Um, you, you must realise that the chat is in effect a public place, so please do not have side conversations in that. Um, I would like to welcome any first time viewers and listeners to this Environment and Select Committee. Um, next thing is that this year marks the third anniversary of the fire at Grenfell Tower, where 72 of our residents tragically lost their lives. I ask every member of the committee to pay their, our deepest respects by marking the moment with 72 seconds of silence. When the silence has been completed, the slide will change. So if we could start the silence now. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, the, the next thing that I would like to say is that um, we've all been uh, suffering under the consequences of the COVID um, pandemic. And I personally would just like to say, perhaps on behalf of all of us, to anybody who's suffered loss during that time, that all of our feelings and condolences are with them, because it's been tough for everybody, but some people have borne the, the, the brunt of this in the most terrible way. So before proceeding with the meeting, I, I would like to repeat to ask members of the committee to mute their microphones and only to unmute themselves when they're addressing the meeting. Once they're done speaking, they should mute themselves again. This will also help us feed, avoid echo feedback and make it easier for everyone to hear members clearly. Also, to save bandwidth, I'd ask councillors only to switch on their cameras when speaking and to remember switch them off after we have spoken. And I think this under, uh, this emphasises the fact that as, as a society that we have come to rely very heavily on the internet and perhaps that we need to reflect on future investment in the internet to make this kind of meetings more robust in future. If any councillor wishes to speak on a particular item and has not been called to speak, uh, I would ask you to ind indicate by typing the letter Q in the chat column uh, on the right hand side of, of the screen. 
Um, and please do not you again, please do not use that column for any other comments um, as they'll be seen by all participants and they are retained on record and available under FRI or other ways. So to assist your fellow councillors, officers and members of the public watching online to identify you, before you speak, if you could state your name um, and if you wish your ward, but that's optional, but certainly if you could state, state your name uh, as, as, as uh, before you speak. If for any reason your connection drops out and you miss something, please can you let us know. In the event of my connection drops, I nominate um, Vice Chair Councillor Charles O'Connor to take over the meeting. So my next job is to um, ask for um, both attendance and declaration of interest. I confirm that I have no declarations of interest to make regarding any of the items on the agenda. And I will now uh, go through the list of members one by one um, and to ask if they have any interest to declare. So, Councillor Erin Noretti. No interest to declare, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Marwan Angali. No interest to declare, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Alison Jackson. No interest to declare. Thank you. Councillor Charles O'Connor. Nothing to declare. Councillor Laura Round. Nothing to declare. Councillor Portia Thaxter. No interest to declare, Chair. Thank you. Um, the, I would also, under A1, membership and chair and vice chair, I would ask the committee to note the membership and the vice chair were agreed at the annual general meeting for the council on the 20th of May, with Councillor Charles O'Connor as the vice chair. A2, apologies for absence <clears throat> and minutes of the 11th of February meeting. Um, could we have confirmation from officers uh, about apologies for absence? Oh, there's no apologies for us. Yes, we have a complete um, group. Thank you. Um, and I've not received any indication of apologies. Um, so whilst many of us were not um, in attendance on the 11th of February due to the new uh, committee constitution uh, membership, um, we the minutes of the 11th of February 2020 have been circulated. Um, does the committee agree to sign them off as a correct record? Now, um, I, I would like first, before I ask that question, to um, ask officers, did they check with the um, chairman, the previous chairman, as to whether he thought that they were correct minutes? Uh, yes, yes, I did. We did. So since the minutes have been agreed as correct by the previous chairman on behalf of the committee that then sat, does this committee agree to sign them off as a correct record? Agree. Thank you. Does anybody disagree with that? No, thank you. <coughs> now we've already gone through A3, which is declarations of interest, so we can move on. So the first substantive item on the agenda under the papers is item A4, environmental sustainability strategy, up, uh, uh, update on air quality and climate change. Um, before I ask uh, for a presentation on this, um, I would like to say that um, I was invited with um, um, one of my colleagues to the Environment Select, um, Environmental Sustainability Strat Strategic Board, um, which in effect is the new board across the borough, um, officers and, and members, focusing on the enactment of the council decision um, to take on board the leadership's proposal of zero carbon for borough activities by 2030 and zero carbon for all activities in the borough by 2040. Now, these are very ambitious um, aims. Um, and I have to say that I still have concerns about the pace and policy uh, within the 10 year action plan. Um, in the sense that we are already um, a, 
more than six months into that 10 year action plan and we have an indication sorry excuse me let's get rid of that um i have so i was saying that i, I have concern in due of the ambitious time scale and the scale and the scale of the project that i have um, concerns that we are not moving faster in terms of creating the policy within that 10-year action plan we're already six months into the into the 10-year period and the area of housing as you'll see from the paper has not been included included in the scope but we can return to that um, perhaps a bit later during questions. Um, this board has been charged with developing an uh, environmental and sustainability strategy across uh, the whole borough, as I say. This will be overarching high level strategy sitting above the more specific action plans, including a new air quality and climate change action plan. Um, so um, A4 paper, I made the assumption in all these meetings that you will have read all the papers perhaps not the culture one which arrived very late but um there were the others that we assume that we've read them um and pay for a4 paper a4 sets out the proposed approach to development of the news strategy so i'd like to call on terry oliver please if you would speak on item a4 thank you councillor let me just turn my background on sorry i could do that before <laughs> Okay, um, so yeah, as as you neatly summarised the paper, so um, we declared climate emergency, um, climate and environment emergency back in October 2019. And with that as well, we um, showed a commitment to meet the World Health Organization uh, air quality standards as well, which are more stringent than the uh, national guidelines. So it just showed that this was a, a priority for the council and rightly so. Um, so the current air quality and climate change action plan um, finishes this April. So we've got a really exciting opportunity now to look at the, the climate emergency that's been declared and pull together all the really good work that the council is doing. And there is a lot of work that housing is doing as well, which kind of gets masked, I suppose, within the existing air quality and climate change action plan. So what we wanted to do is pull together this kind of high level, very measurable, very clear and concise um, environmental sustainability strategy, which really clearly showed those kind of high level ambitions and goals. And we've divided it into five areas. So we've got improving air quality, uh, reducing carbon emissions, and tackling climate change, increasing biodiversity, tackling fuel poverty, and uh, waste minimization. And then all the individual work streams, so such as um, the air quality action plan, the carbon reduction plan, all fit within those. And what we're trying to do as well is bring all the officers and expertise together. So we're looking at having a green task force, which really pushes forward the delivery of that, because we do realize that pace is is crucial in this we have set those very ambitious targets of um being carbon neutral by 2030 as a council but then also 2040 as a borough as well so we do have to be kind of bold and ambitious on this and we've got three cross uh, cross cutting themes as well um so we've got improving um health and well-being community engagement and changing behavior as well so what we would like to do and as you mentioned we had our first board meeting um about a month ago where that kind of gives us oversight and that leadership and we're having that every quarter now and that is really strict that we we have to have that and that provides us that leadership and direction and then that can also be a two-way um communication between that board which is a mic made up of a mixture of um, councillors and um, kind of senior managers within the council as well. And we can bring expertise into that. But then we've got the, the Green Task Force and the um, teams that are actually delivering as well. And they will give regular updates for that. And we want um, a very clear kind of program management, performance management system set up so we can actually keep on top of um, the progress being made. So that's a very, very quick overview. I'm aware there's a few hands that have gone up as well 
Um, but regarding um, the air, sorry, the climate change um, update as well. So it's worth noting that if we start with the, the really good news that we've actually achieved um, the 40 percent um, target that we, we did set within the uh, climate change uh, and um, air quality action plan, we've actually delivered a 52% saving on our baseline against the 40% target. So that is really impressive, but that did not include the housing stock, which moving forward, um, we will have to do. And there's some useful maps and um, graphs. So there's some useful graphs within the um, report as well, which show the distribution, where our emissions come from and how we've reduced over um, since 2000. 7 2008 moving forward we are looking at um hopefully next week going live um to procure a consultant to help us deliver um our carbon neutral roadmap so that will be setting out um ideas and scenarios um around how we can actually achieve um or become carbon neutral as a council by 2030 and then also um as a borough by by 2040 so we would like to have the carbon um reduction plan in place by by the end of the year um and just to give you some time frames for the actual environmental sustainability um strategy that will pull all this together um we're looking to pull that together over the summer ready for um an autumn approval Right, thank you very much indeed. Now, I've got questions from uh, Councillor Portia Thaxter. You were first up, so would you like to pose your question to Terry? Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Chair. Um, thank you, Oliver, for your detailed um, report. Um, you mentioned um, the environmental sustainability strategy. Yeah. You listed five of them. I would just like to know what the waste minimization would look like in practice because yeah. it's a very good idea and a lot of residents in Kensington and Chelsea they are a bit, they they can afford to do food waste. Sure. But it's small. Not very many residents are able to get rid of their food. Yeah. So we need to be able to make sure that there are visible um, recycled bins in order to activate health behavioural change. So I'd just like to know what's going to be done on this part of the, in North Kensington as well as South in order for our residents to be able to take this on board and run with it so that we will have a better environment for our residents to live in. Yeah, that's really good question and um so the waste minimization strand will look at promoting reuse so it's the waste hierarchy so it's reuse um well reduce first of all so if you don't need to buy that item or use that item then don't um reuse if possible and then recycle um as the, the last alternative what we're also doing um as well is look we've got a, um, a plastic free action plan so we're we're promoting that and making sure that we really um, step that up. Um, we're looking at encouraging lo the local economy as well, local suppliers, but we're also looking at the circular economy as well. So rather than having the, the kind of linear economy that we've got at the moment is buy something and dispose of it, what we want to try and do is set up a much more um, circular economy. Um, regarding increasing recycling rates, so um, over the last year, our recycling rate has gone up by just, I think, 1.5%, which doesn't sound much, but that is quite a big step up. Um, so we're just over 28% um, recycling rate now across the borough. And there has been a huge kind of interest in people wanting to recycle much more. So we're looking at doing a lot of work um, with housing management to try and encourage a state uh, recycling because that is one of the areas where um, recycling is the lowest because it's just not as convenient. Um, so we're looking at doing a lot of work around that, making bin stores much more convenient to use, looking at their locations, looking at some of the shoots and stuff like that to see whether we can actually encourage recycling that way as well. And food waste is, is key um, to in increasing the recycling rate. So we're looking at um, with the new waste contract that starts in April, we are looking at a commercial food waste 
um, service, but we're also looking at expanding the domestic food waste collection where we can as well. Um, at the moment, it's around I think about 4,000 properties across the borough that receive that service so we are looking at increasing that and also rolling that out to the markets as well so that is one of our key drivers at the moment is really to try and increase food waste recycling where possible thank you very much just one more thing chair just one more thing thank you so much oliver for that detail um response i I just wanted to um say as well is it possible for you to um engage with these food um, distributors with these packaging because sometimes you don't need all this packaging in your food definitely and it's because it's going straight to the bin i mean it's the trees it's the printing and all that once it comes into the household it's going to the bin i mean okay. else that can be done regarding that but thank you so much for your thank you there is some um there's a, a national um, or a, a new policy that the government are introducing around um, producer responsibility as well. So they are looking at making sure that all the um, producers of packaging and stuff like that um, make sure that it's as minimal as possible. So there is legislation being introduced that will encourage that. And I think that needs to be done at a more of a, a national level rather than a, a local level. But we can definitely help lobby and push for that, definitely. OK, thank you very much, Terry, and thank you very much, Portia. Um, can I ask Charles O'Connor uh, your question, please? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Mr Oliver, for your interesting presentation. Um, the, the strategy is clearly laudable. Um, the question I had, uh, I wanted to explore with you the relationship between the environmental sustainability strategy and planning policy, which is something I come across um, uh, to some extent as, as vice chairman of planning. And what I'd like to know is how planning policy is feeding into the, the strategy and vice versa, and whether planning issues are being taken sufficiently into account in, in formulating the strategy. And uh, there's an example I'd give of um, air conditioning units and um, uh, trees, the, the policy on, on trees when it comes to um, planning applications. There, there are two aspects of planning that clearly have a, a significant environmental impact. And it always strikes me as odd when we're looking at it from a planning perspective that uh, officers approve applications almost invariably um, uh, and, and we do as committee following planning policy um, for uh, air conditioning units and tree removal given the environmental impact of those two things and so what I want to know is whether there's a sort of whether these two things are being looked at discreetly or whether there's a sort of um, some cross thinking going on in between uh, the environmental sustainability strategy and the planning policy yeah. that's that's the intention of the environmental sustainability strategy is to try and pull together all the work that the council is doing around the environment so there aren't those kind of conflicts um there is the green in spd that is being produced at the moment as well so hopefully that will pick up a number of those and that is one of the work streams that will be um kind of linked into the environmental sustainability strategy so um yeah Hopefully the answer is is yes, and that's that was like I said that is the goal of the environmental sustainability strategy is to pull all the different teams together so we are fully aware of what we're all doing and that we're working towards those very those same same goals um, those high level goals which are reducing carbon, um, improving air quality, increasing biodiversity, tackling uh, fuel poverty, and waste minimisation. So that is the definitely the intention of, of bringing all this work together. So, so if I may just ask one follow up, how, how does that work in practice in terms of um, changing the planning policy? Um, that may be a question that I should address to the lead member for planning possibly, but um, I mean, do, do, do um, uh, SPDs have to be produced that suddenly re that, that reflect our, our, our greener approach or how does it work? Um, yeah, so there might be some planning colleagues that might want to um, jump in on that one, but um, there is this green in SPD that is being produced. So um, that at the moment is just starting. So um, the actual remit of that, uh, I'm, I'm not entirely 100% um, on at the moment, but it should be picking up elements like that, definitely. 
Okay. Um, could, okay. Could, thank you. Thank you both. Could I ask uh, for a clarification um, either now or maybe as a follow up to this meeting? Um, it does beg the question, um, which is, will any planning approval in the future uh, have a pre-qualification that the uh, building work carried out as a result of the planning will be carbon neutral? Um, Councillor Will, perhaps, uh, sorry, Councillor Pascal, um, maybe I could pick up on that. It's Jonathan Wade here. Thank you. Um, head of uh, head of um, spatial planning. So, um, yes, you're quite right. We are just in the process of um, beginning on uh, a greening SPD, and we've just uh, appointed consultants ACOM uh, to help us with the evidence base for that. Um, and we've just recently appointed them uh, to do that piece of work. So the time scale for that, and that will be uh, looking at uh, uh, guidance uh, for retrofitting uh, existing building stock, but also uh, what is best practice in terms of moving towards uh, carbon neutral uh, for for the borough for 2040. Uh, that piece of work will probably go out to consultation and have a period of engagement um, in in the autumn with the look to uh, to to adopt it. Uh, uh, at the beginning of next year. Um, now, um, th there's two parts to that. There's the part where it's the supplementary da planning document that offers guidance, but it is guidance. We can't change policy within that document. But the other thing we will be doing is providing the evidence base for new policies coming forward um, in, the, in, the, in the new local plan. So that will be the place where we can actually change the policies. Um, there's a question mark at the moment, to be honest, because it's not entirely clear what the government will do uh, with uh, energy policies. It, there is talk that they may go into the building control regime. Um, that doesn't stop us doing things within planning, but clearly um, there's still a question mark about whether ultimately the control would be through building regulations or whether it would be through planning. Um, with regard to um, any applications that are coming in at the moment, they would be assessed uh, against the development plan policies and clearly those of the London plan and our own local plan. So we would look at it in terms of those policies. Um, clearly the London plan, there is a new version of the London plan. It hasn't been adopted yet. We're not quite sure when it will be, uh, but that does give uh an update perhaps to our own local plan in terms of policies but we are definitely coordinated on this and we are moving forward on it i mean it is just a very simplistic sort of layman's view of life is that if one's building a new building now um say a school or an office or a shop or whatever one would expect that to last more than 10 or 20 years and uh if we are committed as a council, which is the ultimate authority within the council, or the council meeting motion to 2030 and 2040, uh, respectively for borough, for borough and um, the borough area, we would be passing, even if it's uh, possible to pass it under the planning or building regulations at the moment, uh, it doesn't, any passing of a planning application that doesn't conform to carbon neutral now, means that that building will be there and not conform in 2030 and 2040. Sorry, Tanka the Sustainability Projects Manager, if uh, if you allow me just to respond to that question. Yes, please. Yeah, so um, at the moment, uh, as Jonathan uh, rightly said, uh, we are uh, we have a local plan and a London plan, which clearly states that for any new major domestic or residential building that is being built at the moment, they have to follow the zero carbon uh, standards. So we are actually have high standards in place, and this is through the local plan, the existing local plan, and the existing London plan. At the moment, this is only. Uh, considering residential major developments. But as uh, Jonathan mentioned, the new London plan, which we will have to respect um, and align with, uh, and the GLA has announced that this will be uh, published this summer, so in August, 
um, it's clearly stating that it will be extended to commercial, uh, major commercial development. So any commercial or residential building from this year will need to uh, meet the zero carbon standards. Right. I, I mean, and I think this sort of thing would be very useful to have it um, written up as a supplement in our maybe maybe uh, um, we could come to the end when I summarize. But I think having some guidance, having some uh, notes such as this. Uh, as part of the papers that we get would be very useful. Definitely, uh, we will. Uh, so just on that, we already have in the local plan something that is called the zero carbon homes policy. Uh, so if the developer cannot meet the standard on site, uh, they cannot meet the 35 percent, they they will have to pay. So we've created a carbon offset fund uh, which sits under Section 106. And um, at the moment, uh, the idea is that we have we are encouraging developers to meet the standards on site. So the carbon offset is like the last resort, but it's actually stated in our local policy and we will we will be able to provide you notes as well. Okay. And just to just to just to finish on that, we've already been approached by developers like, for example, the National History Museum. Um, and uh, they, they have a new project and they are building a new building and they are actually following the new London plan. So they, they do they do try to follow and build zero carbon buildings and efficient buildings. Great. OK, um, now I have some more um, questions. I think uh, Laura, Councillor Laura Round, I think you were next. Thank you. Uh, firstly, I just want to thank um, thank uh, for the invitation to the board meeting, which was very useful. Um, I do, however, share the chair's slight concern around uh, the progress and just timings, in particular that we, for example, still don't know which senior officers will be leading uh, the charge in each uh, department. But I would also like to just ask um, on the record if we will receive a written update from the departments that weren't able to make it at the board meeting. And also, could I check if and when we will be able to see the outcomes of the mapping exercise um, through the GLA forum, where officers presumably can see the best learnings from other London councils? And um, finally, there are just a number of questions that I'm still waiting to be answered, um, and it has been three weeks now. So I'd just like to make use of this opportunity to ensure these questions aren't forgotten. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Laura, um, I think those were mostly requests, so I don't think we need a reply now, but it would be good to have answers to your questions and the confirmation. It of would the, be nice uh, to know if we are, the two questions are, are we getting a written update from the departments that weren't present and yeah. also with regards to the GLA mapping exercise? Yeah, and who the champions are going to be in each department, because I remember when I did uh, supervise or oversaw the space programme converting the council offices, Having a champion in each department made a difference to achieving the result overall. Um, so, if we could, uh, if we could ask that to be put in the record, uh, those two requests. And if I could move on to uh, Marwan uh, El Nagi, Councillor Marwan El Nagi, you have a question. Um, yes. Uh, good evening, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you so much. Uh, for this uh, report, uh, Mr. Oliver, um, on the on the notes uh, uh, four point uh, six, um, uh, can you just elaborate a little bit uh, on the tackling f fuel uh, poverty? How this is going to be uh, more or less uh, implemented, and um, on the um, uh, mixture of the establishment of the green task force. Um, it will be nice uh, to have, uh, um, and are you considering, uh, if uh, may I say, uh, the academic institutions, those who are already involved in research in uh, environmental uh, impact, uh, altering behavior, especially regarding COVID. Now we can see how it altered our behavior in terms of shopping, uh, being out there. Uh, I don't know about the uh, uh, waste reduction during COVID over the last three months. Did we see any, like, for example, tangible reduction in terms of waste and how this is um, uh, the altering behavior, uh, the changing behavior uh, strategy, uh, how it is going to be linked in the communication strategy with the public? Uh, so I would like some clarification on that, please. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Oh. Chair. Terry. Yep. Thank you, Councillor. So 
the green task force at the moment it's mainly just focused internally but i think that's a really good suggestion to uh, work with all the universities and institutions we are working with some already um, but i think that can be strengthened um, regarding waste reduction um, there has been a drop in waste disposal across the borough um, that has been mainly we feel due to the commercial waste um, not being there so a lot of the businesses um, in the borough not actually opening um, so we feel the residential most probably is pretty much constant um, but the commercial side has reduced um, and then there's a question around um, comms and comms is one of those key services um, that needs to be engaged within the strategy and also the green task force to just ensure that we are getting those very clear messages out there um, that will help with behavior change as well thank you very much um, and may i follow mr chair i just like a, a little bit on the uh, fuel uh, oh, sorry, poverty yeah, yeah, fuel, yeah, uh, yeah. Please. so the fuel poverty tackling fuel poverty um there's a, a few aspects of that so we've got what we call the green doctors scheme already so we're working with a charity called groundwork and that's working um with a lot of people um that vulnerable um residents across the borough to try and in, in improve their fuel efficiency within um, their properties. So there's two strands, I suppose, there's education um, and then also kind of more physical measures. But that tackling fuel poverty is looking at kind of retrofitting homes as well. So there's a huge amount of work that, that can be done around that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Oliver, for this uh, clarification. Much Thanks appreciated. Very much. Um, Councillor Aretti, uh, Aaron Aretti, could you uh, pose, give us your question? Thank you, Chair. Thanks for the time. Um, thank you, Mr. Oliver, for such a great presentation. Uh, the plan is quite ambitious and very promising and looks like we can make it. <clears throat> but just in case we, we got hit by another virus or an alien invasion or something, and we couldn't do it for whatever reason or struck with the disaster. Is there a plan B? Or at least can we release a priority list in specific areas where we can accomplish or a percentage of improvements in specific areas like could be housing, waste, or you know, air quality or something? Um, and a 2030 council operations look very reasonably okay. 2040 for the entire borough wide operations i just in case you know we got hit by another virus or you know it prolonged for like the next five years or we couldn't find a vaccine just in case you got my question yep. it's a good question and um i suppose we've got to come up with plan a first and then we can look at a plan b <laughs> um so we do want to link in the kind of the green recovery within to this within this as well um so that is going to be kind of one of the cross-cutting themes because there's some real opportunities that have come out of covid in terms of the environment so there has been a reduced well improvement in air quality um reduction in carbon um etc so we do want to try and harness those um and the behavior changes that go with those um but yeah the i think our priority is at the moment as you kind of flagged up it is a really ambitious program that we've got to achieve anyway so um it is about getting that plan a and then we can look at if we do need to come up with a plan b if there is a touch wood if there is a another um pandemic or anything like that then we're a bit more flexible I think that if I could comment also, there's a there is. It, I think both this question and the one asked by um, uh, Councillor uh, Anagi previously are about fuel poverty are actually quite interestingly tied together because there are two approaches to dealing with uh, carbon neutral. One is a sort of high tech approach where you do a little bit of insulation and then you find some fancy heat pump and you power it with uh, solar generated electricity which is carbon neutral to, to get to your carbon neutral. The other, uh, the other way of, of doing it is to put more insulation in and less in the way of um, heat pumps um, to correct the climate nearer to what the people living in the building need. And in that case, if, all, if we have some future systems failure, 
The building itself is still a good tea cosy and provides most of what's required for the people living in it. They are different approaches and um, mechanical electrical engineers like the first approach and uh, building engineers and, and uh, uh, passive house designers prefer the second approach. But I think that those two questions uh, pose an interesting cultural point to officers such as Terry and his team. Definitely. Um, could I, uh, Erin, if I could pass on, if that's, you've had the answer to your question there, if I could go on to uh, Alison Jackson, you have a question you'd like. Yeah, well. um, sorry, Chair, I'm, sorry. thank you, Mr. Oliver. I'm not specifically asking for plan B, but I guess you got my point about, you know, yeah. just resilience. It's a resilience. It's resilience, yeah, and it's a resilience. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very right, good one. And I, and I would say that insulating buildings is far superior to heat pumps, which then go wrong. So, you know, that's a prejudice. But anyway, um, I started as an engineer and then became an architect and was converted to more resilient uh, results. Anyway, Alison Jackson, next, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Oliver. Um, could you give me a bit more detail on the monitoring of air quality? I'm thinking in, in this question particularly just about uh, around construction sites and long term around construction sites like over you know, 10 years of large construction sites like Lots Road sure. and so on. Um, it's not just us, you know, it's, it's all sorts of different air pollution. How uh, do you uh, plan to uh, monitor that type of situation? Because we have situations now that will run from, you know, near on a decade. Definitely. That's it's a really good question. So, I'm going to um, ask Stephen Brown from Public Protection to answer that if possible. Yeah, thanks, Terry. Um, unfortunately, Rebecca Brown, who is our pollution team manager, is on holiday this week. But um, I can tell you that we've done, uh, we've had uh, commission consultants to do a lot of work um, for us, looking back over the last two or three years and carrying out some modelling for us because. If we're going, as Terry said at the beginning, we're now trying to achieve the uh, the World Health Organization guideline values, which is a much tougher ask than the uh, the national air quality standards. But to do that, we really need to understand where the pollution is coming from, which boroughs are affected, and which boroughs aren't. So, we have engaged consultants to do that. They're doing, there's, there's an awful lot of modelling taking taken place. We are looking at 2016 as a base year, and then we're doing some more modelling over the next two or three months, so that we can understand. What the changes are over the last two of the next two or three years and hopefully that will give us a much better picture of where the problems are and where it's actually coming from i'm sure you've seen the the graphs already of how air quality has changed given since lockdown um there's been a 50 percent across the board reduction in in nitrogen dioxides but um particular matter uh, has stayed with us um, the pm10s pm 2.5s have stayed with us so it's not a, it's not an easy picture to understand which is why we're doing some extensive modeling and rebecca has told me to tell you that she'll be coming back to you to another meeting and, and probably your next meeting with the results of that modeling so you'll get some detail uh, there i'm sorry i can't be more specific than that um yeah thank you very much and some of the monitors um exist actually um belong to the developers um, so they don't really get monitored uh, by, you know, the controlled by the developers. Um, can can you help with this? Um, well, we do. We do, of course, monitor ourselves. Um, yes, there are there are there are private monitors out there, etc. But we do do monitoring, obviously, our own independent monitoring, so we know what's what the picture is out there. Um, so. Uh, yeah, no, we're not. It's it's it, if you if you're suspicious of the idea that some of these contractors do their own modelling, of course, what they're looking at is making sure that pollutants don't escape the curtilage of their development. Um, we're looking at the picture right across the borough, so we're we're, we're measuring slightly different things, but we we do do enough modelling of our own to 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 get a good picture of what's in the borough. Great. Uh, can I ask one other question? Does the uh, river? Uh, get included in your um, biodiversity section. Um, the river gravel's been, riverbed gravel is being disturbed by the river buses, so it's shooting up onto the shores of Chelsea um, and changing the shape of the river shoreline, um, which I 
look at that seriously. Does this come under, um, obviously it includes yeah. the PLA. So there is a new biodiversity action plan being developed, so I can flag that up to um, our ecology manager um, who can look into that that issue. Um, there is the whole area around kind of flooding um, and um, there is the flood management plan as well, which we need to incorporate into this, which isn't actually listed in the report. So um, if you leave that with me, I can flag that up with our ecology manager. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, Chairman, uh, sorry, Chairman. Yes, um, it's Councillor Round. There are two questions that I didn't get an answer to, and I just wanted to. I'm okay, just hoping I could get. Please. So, so I'll just repeat them. So, a, um, will we get a, a written update from the departments that were unable to make the board meeting? And secondly, will we be shown the outcomes of a mapping exercise through the GLA forum? Yeah, and if I could add a third one to that, is the naming of the champions in the departments across the, the ESSB universe. Yep, I can, um, if they're down as an action for this meeting as well, that, that would make sure that they're, um, you get that information, Laura. Okay, so uh, whoever's taking the note of, the, of this meeting, could you please make those three actions, champions, uh, reports from departments not at the meeting and uh, a summary of the GLA forum uh, best learnings. Okay, um, I don't have any other questions as such, so it, uh, down to me to summarise. I won't try to summarise all the points. I, I, I'd basically like to try to make one overarching uh, point, uh, perhaps um, the point that I wanted to make as well. Um, the Air Quality Climate Change Update Report, which has been published for this meeting, um, talks about the excellent reduction of the sectors that it covers to 11,078 tonnes of carbon per annum. It does not include the RBKC's social housing um, within the RBKC's activities. We have approximately 10,000 housing units within the borough's ownership. Um, uh, 6,000 social use and uh, uh, 4,000 leaseholders at approximately five tonnes per house. So the total there is in the order of 50,000 tonnes compared with all the other activities of the council um, participates in the air quality and climate change plan. So this exemplifies the scale of the job that is not yet been tackled by policies within the, the, the council, albeit but there is action, as mentioned by Terry Oliver, and some of it very excellent action. Um, perhaps the best example of that was the report that most of us got as councillors over the weekend, the Lancaster West newsletter and the actions that they're taking there, um, both technically, financially and also in consultation with the local residents. So it's a very interesting read. And if you haven't seen it, it's about three pages of the 30 page report on the newsletter. Um, but that came in over the weekend. If you haven't had one, I'm sure that governance could make sure that you get copied in. Um, I would ask, uh, Terry, if it was possible for your group to produce within a month a short scoping paper uh, covering, first of all, the question that's been asked to the consultants. So the sort of a briefing of that. I'm not asking for commercial detail to do with their appointment. I'm asking for what they've been asked to look at. Uh, your view about the scope scale um, and pace that needs to be uh, uh, dealt with over the next uh, nine and um, I think if you said October, it's nine, nine and one third years out of the 10 year program. Um, and ideally it, uh, the sketching of a Gantt chart with milestones, but only very broad Gantt chart showing when decisions would have to be made by to achieve the, the target. Uh, we had Doug Goldring at the um, uh, ESSB um, saying that even the latest scheme they built to best standards is nowhere near a passive standard or, an, or a um, uh, carbon neutral. And he's got 10,000 housing units um, and a housing revenue account, which has got no money in it to accommodate this kind of activity. Um, so I, I think the scope, scale and pace question is one that needs to be at least recognised in this meeting. 
um, and I would I would like to have it minuted if the group agree that we have um, a degree of concern. We, we welcome the 2030 and 2040 targets, but we have a degree of concern as to whether the current program is capable of delivering it um, and that we do need to, to start to square the circle. Um, I understand the need to have proper planning of, of processes, but if I had 10,000 houses to, to, to do or housing units to deal with, I'd want in the 10 year program, I'd want to do a thousand of them to the new neutrals, carbon neutral standard this year to be online, let alone ahead of the line. Um, so I think we have a very difficult um, mountain to climb ahead of us. Um, so if I could leave it there um, and ask that we conclude that item A4. Thank you, Terry, for that. Uh, and I move on to A5 and ask uh, Johnny Thalassitis, the um, lead member for planning and transport, if he could give us uh, his uh, top priorities, key priorities. But within that, John, if you could also um, indicate your react, I know you've had to do some very fast footwork in relation to COVID. And some of the things I'd like to hear about from you are those things which are temporary. And if you could de define temporary in that as well, as well as the longer term visionary items. John, are you there? Yeah, I am. But my phone, my, my laptop rather, did just drift out. So I heard the last of my priorities, but I didn't hear. OK, uh, I, in, thank you for coming back to us. Uh, lead member priorities, Johnny Thalassit, his planning and transport. Um, the the uh, obviously some visionary items, but also if you could say <laughs> how you've been coping with, with the um, a sort of um, <coughs> playing at the close to the net and reacting quickly to the COVID requirements uh, and uh, also define, I know one of my fellow councillors wants, wants a definition of what temporary means in that context. Yeah, thanks, Will. Um, so as, as you say, we've had to move very quickly in planning and transport over the last few months to make sure that we're reacting to COVID in the best way that we can. Um, we, we've done some quite radical things, I think, by Kensington and Chelsea standards particularly in transport. So we, we've, we're introducing new school streets, more cycle hangers, uh, some road closures on, on sort of world famous places like Portobello and boutique local shopping streets like Pavilion Road and Butte Street, uh, and also our 20 mile an hour limits across the borough. So, so I think that's all been very positive work. Um, it, it's probably true that the government has forced us to work at a pace that actually is quicker than we would ordinarily like. Um, we're being asked to do things within weeks. And so at times we've had to consult quicker than, than we otherwise would. Um, but nevertheless, I, I think it's been a, a very bold and ambitious program that we've, we've sort of set about. Um, and the, the coup de grace potentially is, is the sort of exploration of, of High Street Kensington for a bike friendly uh, scheme, which we're still looking at. Uh, and going on to planning, I think one of the good things that's come out is that our, our department has adapted very quickly in relation to virtual committees. I think we were the first in the country to get that up and running successfully. That's something that the whole council, as we said about this this sort of culture change, should be proud of. Um, and, and in other areas, going on to my sort of priorities there, uh, I've been very encouraged by the progress we've made on, on housing because one of the most invidious positions we could find ourselves in would be to lose control of major applications and so reaching our annual targets is I think really important if we can do so in a way that is sensitive to, to the local context. Um, we're on track to do that this year and we've still got our own council house building program to, to carry on with and that will hopefully see another hundred or more units approved over the coming months. Um, so so, so I think those are sort of the key things for mine. I, I know that my priorities paper will pick up the local plan, which we're, we're working on as quickly as we can. Uh, clearly, that will be a theme of interest to, to this select committee over the coming months and years. OK, um, thank you. Councillor Aretti, I think we have the first question.
Arian, are you there? Whilst we wait for Arian, should I, should I come back for temporary? I was going to. Sorry, <laughs> Johnny, are you? Hello? Can I go ahead? Check Please do. Yeah, yeah you oh, can go ahead, right. then we'll come back to the temporary thing, Johnny. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Johnny. Uh, very uh, thanks for making the decision to make temporary measures for our people to give an option to travel. However, as I can see, this is a temporary measure, and we can't make this permanent scheme unless it goes through a, a borrower consultation. Mm. So I would like to check and advise that we have a review date in the future, whether it could be two months from now or five months or even six months when it goes back to normal. Because a lot of people I've spoken to in our ward and, and in the borough are very keen that this should be a temporary measure until we goes back to normal. So can you assure me and our residents that they would this would be a temporary measure? Thanks, Ari, and, and we're probably speaking to many of the same people in, in Holland uh, as local residents. I think everything we are doing, we are intending to be temporary. That that is absolutely the case. Um, on some of the schemes that we're we're looking, we've, we've already carried out. There are things like experimental traffic orders, which have a time limit of 18 months anyway, um, and, and so they they couldn't be permanent without that full consultation. I, I think where I need to be slightly more candid with with the committee is that as far as I'm aware, no borough has sort of, no borough in London that is, has set out sort of detailed timeframes for their temporary schemes across the piece. Um, so, so there is to a degree a movable feast. What I can say and return to is that absolutely we intend for everything to be temporary. We will review it and it will only become permanent if it's seen to work by, by local residents. Um, I think you know, there's, there's sort of a natural, there's a natural breaking point with sort of end of summer and the sort of immediate post lockdown. So we could be the first borrower to have a review then, lead by example. Well, in fact, that's a good idea. Maybe we can. <laughs> right. All right. Thank you. So, Johnny, your sound's breaking up. Sorry, I, I was cheering Arian for a thoughtful suggestion. Right. Thank you very much. Okay. But I, I, I think that it would be useful because um, we will invite you back to the next meeting, I'm sure, and it would be useful to have a, a review because, as you said, some of your things are experiments um, and maybe, you know, experiments by their very nature. Sometimes they're brilliantly successful and sometimes they fail and they need to be washed away pretty quick. Um, and we learn by that, that process. So it would be useful uh, when we see you again um, and our next meeting, perhaps, to have uh, some thoughts on how temporary uh, some things have been and some things may work sufficiently well that you want to go through consultation and make them permanent. So, um, but some sort of recalibration of that would be useful after another few months experience. Mm, no, I, I, I agree with that. We're already reviewing things all the time. And, and there's a good example with a, a draft low traffic neighbourhood scheme in, in North Kensington, where we had talked about looking at a scheme there we listened to a lot of local opposition and we decided not to take it forward. So, so there is that iterative review process, but I, I fully appreciate yeah. the need to have a, a slightly more formal timeline and, yeah. and we will do our best to bring that back to the next meeting. Okay. Um, Portia Thaxter, Councillor Portia Thaxter, I think I've got you next. Yes, Chair. Thank you, Chair. And I want to thank Johnny for the hard work that he's been doing for the community and keep doing it you know we appreciate it very much and I, I wanted to just touch on the fact that the children will be going back to school in September now what are we doing to lobby um, the London transport to ensure that the children will be safely transported to school considering the social distancing rule because if you see the 52 or the 342 on a, on a morning is packed like sardines. Mm. So how are we going to ensure that these children are going to be able to get to school in time and mm. in the right social distancing role? Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's a really good question, Portia, and thanks for all the work that you're doing as well. Um, we are in as much dialogue with TfL on these kinds of things as we can be. 
Um, it, it's been regrettable at times that we haven't always been consulted at a political level about schemes in our borough. So, you know, the pavement widening on Earls Court Road, I, I, I never held a meeting with TfL to discuss it. And, and so that's something I want to review too. Um, but thinking about buses, I, I think what we need to do is get as much of our of our bus capacity and our tube capacity running as soon as possible as we can, because it's clearly critical to socially distance and, and we will, where possible, make that case to directly to TfL. Um, as a counseling a lot though, also keep to and from school safety. Uh, so I've been doing a little ring round various wards across the borough. Um, our ambition is to get five or ten new school streets up and running for September too. So timed partial road closures at uh, drop off and pick up times at the start and the end of the day um, so that we can promote uh, better air quality around the school gates, but also walking and cycling to and, to and from uh, classrooms. And, and I think that will make a difference too. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Portia. Um, Alison Jackson, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Johnny. Um, I just uh, wanted to ask you, Johnny, if this is the right place, uh, for, just to talk about high streets for a second, um, because obviously they're sort of not going so well, and COVID, obviously, it's been horrible, um, and they've got to be reignited to be, you know, an exciting place for the borough. Um, and whether, you, you know, we can look at this um, and create a buzz, not just a place to buy, but uh, a place to be, create destination sites so that people actually want to come to each, um, to each high street. Like people, you know, can't wait to get to South Kensington for their French uh, Kensington High Street or a latest piece of fashion in the King's Road, that one creates extraordinary experiences, uh, inverted commas, within each area so that it creates a hub of enjoyment, which then hopefully will encourage people to buy in a different way from just like, shop after shop after shop. So that and now's an opportunity, now everything's been shut uh, and it's going to be hard to uh, get business back on the ground to have a new way of thinking about things, um, you know, which may include more pedestrianisation, but it's uh, an experience that encourages people to eat, drink, buy, uh, enjoy um, in the high streets. And I'd, I'd very much like to... Um, talk about. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, John. Uh, yeah, no, thank, thank you, Alison. I, those are all very good points. And, and actually, making our borough a uh, destination is something that I think a lot of different lead members are working on from various strands. It's a very cross cutting piece of work. Um, from, from a transport perspective, as you say, I think more pedestrianisation is a really good thing. We're already actively looking at opportunities to do that in, in other parts of the borough. I've been talking to people about All Saints Road. There have been some early conversations about Chelsea Green, particularly around sort of local neighbourhood centres. Um, but then sort of when you take it into other portfolios, and without presuming to speak too much for them, when you think of street markets and drive-in cinemas and all those kinds of things that you're seeing popping up across the city, I, I think there's appetite to look at whether they can work in this borough. There's, there's appetite to reimagine uh, our streets and our high streets and, and um, I, I would welcome working with you on that uh, over the coming weeks and, and months. I Thank mean, you I think, Yeah, I think that would be great and I don't know whether that includes more residential as well with the shops changing face, uh, but maybe that's a, something for further discussion. Um, another, just another question, Johnny, on 100 uh, West Cromwell Road. I know that's sort of been and gone, uh, but um, I just wanted to just a quick word on architecture. Um, you know, the remarkable design 
that, again, people come to uh, the Royal Borough for, as a destination site because of its remarkable design and architecture and gardens and mixture of urban and residential altogether. And 100 uh, West Cromwell Road is not remarkable. Um, and it is the gateway to uh, the borough of the M4. And it's the first thing that you're going to see. Uh, and it's much taller than obviously any of the other buildings around there. And it's, it's you know, not something that's going to draw people to go and have a look at. Is it not possible to really lobby for remarkably designed buildings that attract people, that are really a bit of a, an encouragement? Uh, because once something's built like this, it just sets such a precedent for more, more to be repeated like this. And I know that this sort of came and sort of set in stone anyway, and it was a sort of push through, but is there a way forward on that point? And also the point of circumventing or seeing a way through any mayor requests like this, really, that don't really quite fit with the, uh, the borough design? Oh, hello. I'm I'm sorry. I think my Wi-Fi cut out again. But I, uh, I I did hear Alison's question about architecture, and I think it's a very good one. Um, I I think it's important to remember that this was a a, a mayor of London who who led the approval on this. Um, and, and for me, it just underlines the importance of making sure that we retain control of our major sites because we can see that where uh, we don't hit housing targets and and other requirements and the mayor intervenes, uh, we, we don't get good outcomes in this borough. We've seen that with the failed scheme on Holland Park Avenue. Uh, we, we've seen a regrettable decision about Newcomb House. We've fought plans at the Holiday Inn. And I think this is all about making sure that we as a borough retain control of major sites and, and that we work very hard with our communities on establishing good architecture in, in any new building across the borough. Um, could I possibly follow up on that one? I think, thanks, Alison, for that point, and Johnny, for your answer. Um, <clears throat> those schemes that you mentioned, um, some of us bear the campaign scars with regard to those individual buildings or on committees and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but one that is coming up in the future, timescale unknown yet, but it will come up, I'm, we're pretty sure, from what we've heard, is the site for the Royal Brompton which is a major site and may not just be the Royal Brompton itself um, because there may be uh, some kind of um, follow on from other hospitals if we're not careful. So mm -hmm. the question is how we learn from what Alison was talking about and we in, in, uh, plan forward for how the community, that's the whole of the borough and south, south uh, in, in Chelsea in particular, um, would like to see that site over the next um, long period and what needs to be happening now with regards to uh, preliminary planning activities and consultation with local residents for that matter as to how they would like to see you know the the, uh, the local area so Johnny if you could give us an outline as to how the planning department is gripping that future issue thanks well, I, I really do think, actually, that's one of the defining issues that this borough faces. If there's one thing we've learned during COVID, it's that uh, health care and, and hospitals are, are just about the most important thing in, in all of our communities. They, they, they save lives and they add immeasurably to, to, to everything about Kensington and Chelsea, our sort of centre of excellence in that, in that part of Chelsea. Um, fr from a planning perspective, we've been working round the clock to make sure that we can uh, safeguard uh, the Brompton for as long, eternally, if we can, in, in this borough, we, we would resist any plans to move it. We, we already are. We're already working hard at that. We, we've got a petition up and running, which I would invite any viewer who hasn't yet to sign up to on change.org, save our Brompton hospital. Um, we've been talking about our resident associations about the campaign. We, we intend to step things up over the coming months. Um, it, it's something that I think the entire borough ought to rally around. Um, losing hospitals in our local area is not a good outcome for, for anybody in Kensington and Chelsea. 
Um, specific yawn planning, we're already hard at work updating our Brompton SPD. Um, we're out there forming the evidence base uh, and, and in the coming months we will be consulting fully on that piece of work, trying to make sure that as much as it can it protects that medical use because we are absolutely determined that the Brompton should stay in Kensington and Chelsea. Following on from that, the, the is there anything to be learned from the um, activity that, I mean, I think probably the best example of the borough was in St Quintins and, um, about looking at a local area plan for that area, or would you think the SPD is going to do the job? Uh, well, well I, I always defer where I can to, to the planners on questions of substance like that. W what I'm determined in my role as a lead member is that we must do everything we can to safeguard the Brompton. If we as a community feel that a, a neighbourhood plan is the way to go to do that, then I'm happy to work with anybody and anyone who, who, who wants to begin that piece of work. They have an ally in the council um, and, and we will work as much as we can uh, to yeah. deliver fantastic medical use on that, that site. I remember from talking to Henry that there's quite a lot of... Uh hard effort that needs to go into that sort of thing but he he did suggest that it was worth it in the end um so maybe uh the feedback that's gone through the chelsea society and they may sorry the kensington society they might feed it through to the chelsea society just to see when we do some consultation around whether there's an appetite for that mm -hmm. um now where are we on on this we've uh, uh, I think we're on to Marwan. You're next. Marwan Angadi, um, have you got a question? Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's uh, it's really good uh, to see this report, uh, Johnny. It's excellent. And I can see the enthusiasm and the uh, <laughs> forward looking uh, into the implementation, which has uh, got all the energy of the youth uh, there. Um, <laughs> Um, and, and now uh, what, what I would like to see there as well, Johnny, regarding the uh, now we are more or less easing the uh, lockdown and there are some uh, I've noticed uh, many restaurants and coffee shops now putting tables outside on pavement. How responsive are we reg uh, regarding the business request for adjusting the behavior and widening the pavement? Um, in in North Kensington, and for the, I haven't been to uh, um, to the area down south at the moment, but I'm walking around and I can see there is um, ample uh, room for improvement regarding uh, the widening of those pavements. So, how responsive are we as a council to business requests uh, being put to us to address their need regarding a safe walk in those pavements? This is one thing. Yeah. And the other thing is um, I really do welcome the extending of the uh, uh, limit uh, for the uh, uh, speed limit um, mm -hmm. into the uh, in our borough, because this is really now uh, encouraging cycling, walking more, uh, mm -hmm. behavior changed. Um, I think people are walking more, cycling more. I've seen, I've never seen uh, cyclists as I've see, uh, I lived here for that uh, length of time. So this is one of the positive outcome of uh, COVID, um, um, which is altering behavior, uh, our behavior, the way we walk, engage, and so on. So how are we closely monitoring? Uh, for example, when we are monitoring a certain area or zone within the uh, particular area, can we just, uh, in addition to the notices we put up, like a 20 or 30 alteration, to put like a communication or message with those signs so people can read and reflect on them as well. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Marwan. Um, I, I think those are both very good questions. Um, when it comes to pavement widening, we actually bid for, for more money than we needed for our first phase of sites, precisely so that we could proactively respond to, to business requests about, about widening pavements. Uh, we're, ver we're very happy to do it. Um, it does take a week or two to design the schemes of pavement widening, so the sooner the better. But if you're aware of places in your ward or in North Kensington uh, where you think it could work well, then then I'm very happy to take that up with you. Um, I, I know the first few places we did Kensington High Street, uh, Notting Hill Gate and, and Kings Road, so sort of middle, north and south, we, we 
we tried to cover the borough to a degree, but but you know there will always be places that sort of has lot we ease out of lockdown. We'll find a better or worse you know places for that kind of thing. Um, our, our big our big thing has always been protecting lives and protecting livelihoods, and this sits very comfortably within that folio of work. Um, so so as I say, let, let, let's let's pick that one up. Um, on, on sort of speed limits and communications, we, we have, as you say, welcome 20 mile an hour limits into the borough. Where we piloted them in St. Helens and Dalgano, we found that there was a, a 10% reduction in speeds and the number of speeding vehicles down 60%. So I am encouraged that these can have a really positive difference uh, at, the, at a borough-wide level. When, when it comes to communications, we, we've tried a couple of different things at the moment, and it's always fun. You get different kind of feedback. So generally in the south, I'm told we want smaller signs because we want less street clutter. And in the north, they say we want bigger signs because they're speeding down Barbie Road. Uh, so there's always a bit of a juggling act to play because we want to try and be as consistent as possible. Um, and at times we also paint sort of 20 see on the road in those roundels um, and, and actually generally that's probably united people a bit more than either of the two former options um, the, i think the most ambitious thing that we've tried so far and we've got capacity to do it in a few places i mean perhaps even with neighborhood cell applications open is something you want to consider in your wards um, but we have introduced a speed indicator device on barbie road so that sort of sig that tells you what speed you're going at uh, and 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 it allows uh, people to sort of raise awareness of the new speed limits that allows people to more accurately assess how fast cars mm. are going because often perception can be can be half the battle with these things. Um, so 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 I'd encourage you to look into those and meditate on that a bit more deeply. Uh, but in the meantime, we will we will continue with these new speed limits okay. and, and I think that's good. Thanks, Johnny. Can Thank we, you so we, much, Johnny. On? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Laura. Laura Rand, um, Councillor Laura Rand, please. Thank you. Um, it's been really impressive to see how quickly the council has adapted to the unprecedented circumstances. Um, last week, the government made an announcement on legalising rental e-scooter trials. Um, what forward-looking thinking is taking place within our council now that it looks increasingly likely that there will be an uptake in e-scooters across London? Johnny? Sorry, uh, that was on e-scooters, I believe. Yeah. It, it, it did cut out briefly. Um, I, I, I know yeah, that sort Laura... of now, now that government has made an announcement on legalising rental e-scooters and that it's likely there's going to be an, un an uptake across London, what forward-looking thinking is taking place within the council? Uh, well, well, Laura, I, I think that there's no greater example of forward thinking within the council than your evangelism for e-scooters. Um, and, and, I, and I share it in many ways. Um, we're, we're happy to work with, with government on, on, on this pilot where possible. I, I think what I would like to see is a little bit more uh, literature on, on how it can be regulated and, and how sort of, you know, we, we don't want things like e-scooters scooting down the pavements where, you know, if we, if we can help it. But, but I totally take the point that this could be transformational for active travel uh, I, I, I do want to see it working across across the city, and if KNC can play a part, then I, I'm sure we will. Thank you. I think my main concern is that if it's you know if it's going to happen, we you know we don't want to be caught in a situation where there are all these e-scooters without sort of a plan in place to how to respond to that. I mean, in one of, one of the ways, um, presumably, Johnny, you're, you and your officers are in touch with the potential providers of these hire scooters, um, and they could answer some of these questions, because I remember this debate was going on a couple of years ago, not only in relation to bikes, but also with the forthcoming scooters. And one of the main issues at that time was a question of parking of these bikes. And I understand that they have the technology, and they certainly had the technology a year or two ago, to geofence the parking. In other words, you stay on hire unless you put your bike precisely where you're told to put it within a couple of inches. Um, so though those, as long as those things are baked into the scheme, we shouldn't have any dangerous uh, e-scooters all over the place for blind people to bump into. Um, and uh, we should have some regulation on the pavements as well, because they can discern whether the bikes, or the scooters on the pavement or not. Yeah, no, I, I think those are all good points 
well. The challenge is, is that I think we probably do have a study uh, older population in Kensington and Chelsea than, than some of our counterparts in central London. And and therefore, we move in, in slightly different ways. There's probably more local walking than sort of cross city traveling. I know, I know we've got one of the best records of any borough in, in the city on the on the percentage or the proportion of, of trips that are taken by walking. Um, and, and so I'm always conscious that, that our needs aren't always uh, exactly in the sync with with wider London and, and trying to bridge that is one of probably the biggest challenges in this portfolio. Um, but 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 I am absolutely keen to, to work on these cases yeah. and I, I totally recognise their potential. I think a lot of what Laura's concerned about could be actually provided by the uh, scooter providers by using the tech that they now have. Yeah, no, and and we and, and I should probably add we we have been in touch with it with a handful of these providers and, and it's something that's come up at london councils and it yeah. uh and and within the sort of borough leads on these kinds of things and it is something that we're we're thinking about all the time good okay um i think we've reached the end of questions on on for you at the moment johnny i know there's going to be a couple of questions coming up for you on the next item a6 so i hope you're not planning on leaving now that you've given us your tour de force um <laughs> and uh I think the there are there are a number. Of, I won't try to summarise the um, uh, discussion that we've had. There was a number of items which will be on the the notes. There are too numerous to mention individually now. But thank you very much indeed. And I would like to ask you to um, come to a future meeting because this is a fast moving field. So um, I hope you don't mind being invited for a repeat performance. A six planning advisory service peer challenge recommendations. Uh, last year, the Independent Planning Advisory Service, PAS, carried out a review of the planning function of RBKC. Now, there was um, this was submitted back in September 2019, um, and there were a number of recommendations which the paper you would have read, um, and that the officers of the 11th of February meeting of this uh, uh, committee um, uh, stated that the report was broadly positive, and its assessment of planning departments and many risk proposals already under consideration. Um, committee members on 11th of February felt there should be more guidance for objectors on material planning issues. There'd be better signposting reports, summary tables, officers' response to objections. There should be increased membership of the planning committee, early input by ward uh, members and residents' associations at pre application stage would give greater understanding of local context. And planning officers did not always seek members' views, which should system in learning about the local context. I mean, one of the pet points has been made to me is that what percentage of planning officers actually live in in the in the borough and um, a number of local residents who are concerned that people very expert in planning, but with no experience of living in the borough are, are making a lot of delegated and interpretive um, decisions. Um, I think one of the other things that came out of the report itself was that there should be uh, considerable consultation with the uh, lo in, in local residents, associations, and communities. And whilst there is uh, a summary of new ways of doing these things, um, I have been asked to relay uh, the point from the Kensington Society that they are disappointed at not being uh, fully consulted on this um, uh, um, process, this, this, uh, this item. Um, I know they did, did have an attend. They did have a meeting with with officers, but it was not a, a very thorough, lengthy, or successful meeting. I understand. So I think that there is a need for further consultation on this area. But if I could ask um, John Wade to speak on item A six. Could um could I could I come in briefly on on the Kensington yep. Society's point, Chair, and and just restate what I did say to to the chair of the Kensington Society this afternoon, that we do want to hear from them. We're very sensitive to, to their views. And that just as we brought this very paper and invited scrutiny of it at the February meeting, uh, that same offer stands. We really want them to be involved uh, uh, and did so to the Chelsea Society, our, our two great amenity societies, as, as, I, as I know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and there are there are many many other that ones that are 
uh, constituent parts of those society, ranging mm. from Ladbroke to Ca Cracker in the south. Absolutely. Um, so um, I, I think that I also uh, did pick up the fact that the previous committee decided not to engage in any particular way with this uh, area in a substantial way. And I think that um, uh, are subject to my advice and my, my members, here, I would, um, personally speaking, I think that it's very important that, that we as scrutiny work uh, in a critical friend way with you, Johnny, and also officers mm -hmm. to provide the maximum amount of uh, communication possible. Because one of the key elements that was in the um, uh, report and review was that there were many instances where there was a misunderstanding or lack of knowledge or a, um, a, a perceived transparency and a lot of that could be got over with better con consultation. Um, so I think there's still a big job of work to be done. And from the scrutiny, uh, sorry, select committee's point of view, um, I would I would hope that we could engage and help help uh, engage in that. It's not something we can decide the detail form of tonight, but if we can agree that we will address this issue in terms of, of uh, consultation, that we will then work outside the meeting with officers to put that together. Um, so if I could, if John, if that's OK, if I could move now on to John Wade and give you, John, an, an opportunity of speaking. Uh, thank you, Councillor Pascal. Um, I think I'd so just emphasise um, with regard to this report that this is actually the beginning uh, of a dialogue, um, both with um, councillors, uh, other interested parties, and of course with our residents and other community associations. This is not the end. This is just the the uh, a signpost about how we wish to proceed um, in relation to the recommendations that the planning advisory service made last year. So I think it's important to say that nobody's missed the boat on this. This is the beginning. And really what we try to do in this paper is really to to start to set out um, what we plan to do and what we're doing at the moment um, in, in, in terms of um, the recommendations. So I think we, 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 we totally understand that, that, that you know, pre-engagement and consultation with residents rather than uh, having, you know, schemes coming forward late in the day and, and us developing work without uh, working closely uh, in collaboration with, with local residents and the communities is something that we is, is is fundamental to the way we want to we want to work moving forward, and I think in some ways we've made a good start on that. Um, certainly in terms of the local plan um, and some of the work we've been doing at uh, you know Kensal, we've made a real conscious effort to to engage in other ways, and I I think probably the the the, the thing that we're we're also conscious of is that we're trying to get a much wider um reach uh, into our communities and yes of course we want to involve the established residents associations it's really important but it's also really important that we we make contact with those really harder to reach groups and it's been much more difficult in planning terms to actually manage to do that so we are committed to do that and i think um some of the initiatives that we've done uh, through the use of uh uh, built ID um, in terms of uh, IT has been really quite impressive and um, we've managed to at least uh, get document planning documents to a much wider audience or at least bring it to their attention than we ever managed before. So I think there are things that we're doing. We'd, we'd, we're concentrating going more out into the community to, to engage, particularly those harder to reach groups. Uh, I think we welcome the uh, continued dialogue with um, our amenity societies and we recognise that, you know, we need to grow on that. So I think, you know, in terms of uh, societies like the Kensington Society and the Chelsea Society, we will be looking to have more regular, uh, more regularly timetabled dialogue uh, with those two groups. Um, I think probably the one area that um, I, I know that a lot of amenity societies and residents have expressed concern with is pre-application with regard to development management. Uh, in other words, our, our planning applications. And I think we're acutely conscious of that. So, you know, the paper does refer to the setting up of um, a development forums as part of the pre-application process. 
Uh, and indeed, we, we're actively working on that at the moment. I think it's fair to say if we if we hadn't got into lockdown, then we would have already probably had a process in place about how to do that. Um, obviously, in lockdown, um, with social distancing, which is not going to go away for some time, we're currently thinking about how the best way we might deal with this. So um, at the moment, we hope to uh, put something out uh, fairly shortly, which I'm sure we can we can talk to our uh, our principal residents uh, associations about and hopefully start a dialogue about how we we move forward with this. Um, but it is our intention that we do try and work closely uh, we, with our residents. I know they don't feel that we do, but I'm for one have always been an advocate of talking and I will continue to do so. And I'm sure my colleagues do as well. So I wouldn't want to give any impression that we are trying to push through all of these um, uh, ideas without actually engaging uh, w with our residents on that. So I, I think moving forward, we are looking for maybe a group to be set up to have more dialogue with. And, uh, you know, that, that that may be through some of our councillors. It, it, it may be through others as well. But um, anyway, the report set out there. Um, clearly, we've tried to respond to all the recommendations, but um, clearly, if there's particular questions regarding it, I'm sure uh, myself or colleagues on this call could could try and answer them. Well, I think before I open the questions, I very much welcome um, your uh, restatement of the uh, wish to interact with established means of communicating through resident associations, but also into new areas. I, I, I even within my own ward, I know that. Um, there are areas which are extremely well represented by the established resident associations in the sense that there's one in every street and they belong then to a collective one which then feeds into the Chelsea Society. So they are very, very aware of individual developments uh, down literally and then there's the, contract, the construction site management and all of that, that sort of stuff. But in, in other areas, um, there are uh, populations not only in social housing but also in in uh, private rental housing as well that all different parts of the the economic band um, who maybe are not so engaged in those established resident associations and having alternative methods in addition um, it can only be a, a good thing and I think it also would be true to say this is a two-way street that uh, as we move into an era partly because it's happening anyway, and partly because of the imperative under COVID um, restrictions, that um, I think that it would be useful to uh, uh, show the uh, options and strengths of IT and other other kinds of consultation to the resident associations, so maybe they can engage better in those as well, and they can have a wider uh, engagement with their with their members as a result. Um, because I think it would be a, a, a bad idea if the resident associations did it their way and, and, and we uh, as a council did it that way plus IT and they, they didn't because uh, it would again is a sort of them and us um, kind of situation. But um, thank you. Now, um, in terms of questions, who would like to ask? A, um, I think we've got a Alison Jackson question. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, um, thank you, um, Mr. Wade. Um, I really welcome this because I've got a lot of uh, planning uh, questions and, uh, you know, it would be, you know, really uh, fantastic for the uh, residents associations and the societies, but also uh, for the individuals, the people who sit outside uh, of those uh, societies and residents associations as well. Um, and how, how do you see it working for um, residents who don't uh, sit in within the um, societies and uh, residents associations? Would be one question. And the um, other question is, uh, do you think that, uh, the, the, that some form of education within schools at an early age about planning, about getting a home, uh, having a home and applications and some kind of dialogue with the council approach and processes could be useful in terms of that, uh, sort of upcoming age group? 
Um, so, so, so in relation to your first question, I think I think uh, you're absolutely right. I think probably the, the biggest challenge we all have is how to engage with those residents, particularly those that are not part of established residence associations. Um, it's really difficult, and I'm not I'm not going to pretend that it's an easy thing to do. I mean, one of the things that we have looked at lately um, is we've we've looked at our housing associations, and we've we've uh, looked at particular tenant representatives uh, who who represent different parts of social housing blocks in different parts of the borough. Um, we we have identified those as sort of conduits of of relaying. Um, information and, and the possible engagement workshops uh, about to discuss in an informal way about um, emerging planning issues. And I think we're really keen on doing that. It's something that we haven't done before. It's, it is quite resource intensive, to be honest, but I think we see the benefits of it. And actually, um, you know, from, from my perspective, I've done planning for many years, I'd much rather sit around the table and talk to someone through a chat an, an early stage than stand up in a public meeting while somebody's sort of shouting at you. It's, it's really not a particularly, uh, you know, useful dialogue to have. Um, so I think we are committed to do that. I think what it will involve is perhaps when social distancing finally, you know, comes to comes to an end, we would like to go out into the communities and arrange particular meetings. And we will try and um, publicise those so that we know, you know, that we can actually have a sort of constructive dialogue uh, with uh, those members of the community, rather than always expect, expecting them to come in, uh, come into the town hall. I think it's more difficult in lockdown. I think, as, as, as Councillor Pascal has said, I think the only thing we can really try and do is see working with our community engagement team as to whether we can set up some meetings where um, you know the, the IT equipment is available so that we can have uh, some of these dialogues um, and we can find particular you know community representatives perhaps to represent others um, in terms of what their views are and, and, and at least publicize you know initiatives and things that start to come forward. We've got a lot of work to do on the local plan um, even things like the greening SPD you know it would be good to have an engagement conversation on that. There's lots of other development, as 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 you know, that's going forward, and it's always a great idea to 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 have those um, early engagement and chats with, with with locals who obviously are affected. Um, so we are committed to that. I think the hardest thing is just how to do it. But I think I probably outlined what we what we would plan to do. With regard to your second question about dialogue with schools, another great idea. I think we're totally supportive of that. We did a little bit in the past with regard to the local plan. And certainly I've been out once or twice quite a few years ago now, and it was the primary schools, to talk to them about planning in the borough. And they got very, very engaged and they were really excited, the children. And they actually uh, what was great was they didn't realise that planning was a really dull thing to do. It was actually really exciting, which uh, I, 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 I passionately believe in. I think it is it, it is something that um, um, Dan Massey, who's who's leading our, our uh, Kensal team, is is looking at doing as part of the engagement as as the Kensal opportunity area emerges. And we really like to do more of it. And I think we should do it as part of the emerging local plan process. It's not always easy to do. And in fact, when we have tried to engage in secondary schools in the past, they've said that their syllabus has been such that they've not really had uh, the opportunity to engage. Um, I would hope that, um, that that, you know, that that could change, but we will always offer it uh, as, a, as an opportunity. And I think moving forward, yes, we will. We would love to have dialogue with with, with local schools. Great. Thank you very much. Um, now, uh, Portia, uh, Portia Thaxter, Councillor Portia Thaxter, would you like to you, ask a question? Thank you, Chair. I was going back to um, uh, Jonathan. Um, he said that it's very difficult, which I understand, to engage with those local residents who are not a part of RA um, Residents Association. Um, I was. I, I would like to suggest if we could just go into some of the organisations that we are linked with. 
for example, the Citizen Advice Bureau or the Job Centre, uh, Prospects, Pepper Plot, all these other organisations that we're linked with, we, surely we can do like maybe a questionnaire in order to identify these people who are not engaging them so that we can reach out to them and ask them questions because there are a large amount of them out there. Thank you very much, Portia. Um, I think I'd, I'd also add, if we're adding things in pot, is that um, Doug Goldring and, and his team have done a lot of uh, consultations since the social housing stock was brought back in, back in house after the uh, termination of the TMO. Um, and that's right across the borough. I mean, obviously, there's probably more in the north, but it, it certainly inclu includes um, the, the social housing in the south as well. And they've had a lot of consultation and maybe their some of their experience and contacts would, would help you in what you want to achieve, Jonathan. Um, right. I, I'm conscious of time. And um, unless that, I, I think I had uh, Charles O'Connor. Did you want to ask a question here? Hello? Uh, sorry, beg your pardon, uh, just turning off the mute. No, I think it's been covered actually here. Okay, much. and also you brought it up earlier as, as a subject, the linking between ESSB and the planning and so on. Um, and we've got agreement that we are going to have consultation with um, RAs and uh, as wide as possible following this meeting. So um, that's really the only recommendation I wanted to, to uh, draw to attention at the moment. Um, if we could, there. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Indeed, and thank you everybody for your questions. So, uh, sorry, pardon me. Uh, I've Chairman, got another one. Can I ask a question? Of course, you can. Sorry, I've only just popped up. Okay. All right. So this is either to Councillor Thalassites or to um, Mr. Wade. I don't mind, but it's about um, Section 3.21 of the report. So it's about the board, basically. So firstly, there is no real explanation of why a board would make us less liable to get call-ins by the mayor. There's not much of a description of what a board would actually be like, what it would do, what it would comprise of. Um, but crucially, um, the thing that concerns me most is could you uh, reassure me and confirm to me that a board would not take upon it the decision making powers of the planning applications committee because to do that um you know on major developments to take it out of a public arena and away from elected councillors um is just unthinkable to me so can you confirm or clarify what exactly the board would do and why it would be helpful. Um, I, I, I'm sure um, Councillor Thalassitis might want to, but I can I, I, I can say categorically that a board would not be there to replace any planning committee. A planning committee is a statutory way that we have exactly. to deal with planning applications in public. This is not, and I emphasise that, uh, this is uh, the recommendation for a board would be an internal working party, I think, to provide better coordination within the, within the council. It's not a decision making body in yeah. any shape or form. So l l let's just make that very, very clear. I think the point that was coming across here, and as I said, uh, uh, um, I'm sure Councillor Thalassitis might want to add to it, was that when they when I think when the uh, the working party when, when Paz came and and saw what we did, they felt that perhaps with you know a good growth strategy where we've got to move forward with 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 more things like housing, and uh, other other matters that it might be an idea whether we had uh, more better coordination internally within the council, whether there was some sort of strategic board set up. And I, 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 this is this is for internal working to coordinate different different aspects of what goes into good growth. I think our response to that was that we have made quite significant progress, uh, I think, since since uh, Paz visited last year. And in fact, now there are quite a lot of um, there's a lot of cross cutting work that we do um, across departments, and I think we've got a clear lead as to what our uh, recommendations are and what we need to do. We've got a council plan now adopted. So um, I think from our perspective, we're not necessarily saying that we need uh, to have a strategic board. 
Uh, we have got um, a, a sort of board of governance for for Kensal, uh, which is which is operating and is 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 really useful. Um, and as new as as more development sites come forward, and as part of the local plan process, we will need to put other mechanisms in place. But I think at the moment we feel that there is enough coordination across the council without necessarily yet another strategic board being set up. These are only recommendations. These are only things to consider. They're not saying that we need to do that. But I think I'll, I'll leave it to Councillor Thalassitis if he, I'm sure he wants to add to what I've said. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, sorry, thank you, John. Uh, thank you, Johnny. Would you like to just chip in briefly? Yeah, I, I would. And I, I would like to scotch into the into a blue idea that anything we're doing is to uh, override anything a committee would decide. Planning committee is sacrosanct to us and uh, and nothing in this report seeks to, to change that. And, and just the same community involvement is too. Um, I, w one of the things that John picked up was, was project boards for some of our opportunity areas and major sites. And I just want to say that uh, before we bring forward any kinds of SPDs or master plans, we, we do intend to talk to our amenity societies and, and resident groups, uh, particularly in the affected areas, about the work that we're doing. So, so it's incredibly important to us that councillors and residents are at the heart of, of our planning process. Um, and with that, I, I, I saw. I think Amanda Reed might be able to, to add some value to this conversation too. Amanda, would you like to say something? Thank you, Councillor. It was just a point of clarity, really, on the um, the reference to the word board in um, paragraph um, 3.21 and 3.22 that's been referenced. Um, it points back to the response to uh, recommendation R4, where we talk about the new homes delivery board. So and I know we're talking about lots of boards here. We're talking about the project boards, but also here we're talking about the um, the new homes delivery board and that has now sat it sat once so far um and we found it to be really helpful um in terms of collegiate working across the organization and i know um councillor pascal you've already referenced um colleagues in housing and we found it to be a, a place where we can um continue to scrutinize um um, housing need across the borough. We can continue to scrutinise housing delivery, particularly mm. across all tenures, um, and it just it just provides us with a central point in terms of that collegiate working piece. So it's just to offer assurance in, and and confirmation. And I apologise if it's not drafted um, appropriately in the report. That when we refer at R5 to a board, we we are referring back to uh, the recommendation of R4, where we reference uh, at the new homes delivery board. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. That's. Could uh, I just make one follow-up question very quickly? Please. Okay. Um, so I think this is really to Councillor Thalassitis. Um, in the next paragraph, it goes on about a working group. And I know um, Councillor Pascal has said he wants to work with you, but could you clarify the working group, the activities described are not scrutiny. So can you confirm that that is not a scrutiny working group because scrutiny can only look at um, the performance of the planning department and also um, planning policy. It cannot look at individual sites and, and make assessments and all the rest of it. That's for the planning committee. Thank you. Yes, I, would, I just to clarify from my point of view in terms of scrutiny, what I wanted to do was to make sure that the activity which was very strongly written up in the report and to a certain extent in the response. Um, and then I also picked up from the, the Kensington Society in particular, but also in another context from the Chelsea Society and other residents associations, that there hasn't been enough consultation on this process. And I know Jonathan was saying this is the beginning, and I think that's a useful clarification. And what I wanted to ensure that the, from a scrutiny point of view, that there is a consultation, whether it's appropriate for our scrutiny committee to uh, or a, a, a select committee to get involved directly in that or not our, our role is primarily to ensure that that consultation takes place and that, that if it's appropriate to to get involved in some aspect of it we'll look at it but I think it's there's not time in this meeting to go through the detailed workings I do take your point there's a difference between policy making and and, and scrutiny can, um, can I just can I just ask um Johnny though to uh, to clarify and confirm that 
the working group referred to is not a scrutiny working group. No, it's so not. It's, no, it's not a scrutiny working group. I mean, I, can well, well, I, 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 I mean, I think it's I, from the from this from the select committee. I can say that it, that, that, that I, my understanding that it's not a not a scrutiny working group. I'm just asking Councillor Thalassoutis to confirm that it's uh, from a working group of the planning committee. I, well, I think there's a difference between a scrutiny working group and a working group that contains scrutineers. Um, that's a new one. We'll have to refer to uh, the scrutiny manager on that. <laughs> I think what I'd say is it's perfectly legitimate for members of a scrutiny committee to oh. sit on a working group, even if that isn't directly tied to their role as members of the scrutiny committee. My point is the activities and the role of the working group set out in this paper are not scrutiny. It has nothing to do with the scrutiny function. It is not scrutiny. That's my point. Well, I, I defer to you on all matters scrutiny. <laughs> Uh, okay. Mary Therese, can we can we take this offline? We're taking yep. up rather a lot of time okay. in this meeting and okay, occupying a lot of people. I think this is a, an important issue, but um, if you and Jackie and I could just discuss this, I think. Okay. Okay. Uh, I don't see any conflict at all, but I know you have concerns. Um, if we could move on to a so, so sorry, if I could thank um, John and Johnny for the previous item and to go on to Crest A7. Um, I think that the uh, this Tim Davis, perhaps if you could just introduce the paper. Hi, good evening. Um, let me just find the paper. The um, Crest 2, as it's locally known, is the next step. So last year we had Crest 1, which was the tie up of the new construction management team with the noise and nuisance team in environmental health. And then from April this year, we've been recruiting and putting into position uh, Crest 2, which is basically getting the wardens on board, a rotor in place, and then going out and starting to cross-pollinate the complaints and inquiries that they'll generate for other, other teams in the Crest family, which also includes the parts police, the waste enforcement, uh, team uh, and the highways enforcement people. So these are the guys that look after the holes in the road. Uh, please excuse the noise. One of my dogs has escaped into the room. My apologies. The um, paper then talks about the success we've had in the last year, uh, some challenges for where we are with the wardens. I can deliver some good news on that. Uh, uniforms are nearly sorted. IT has turned up uh, and there, we have started a rotor of early's and late's uh, not that late at the moment with the six wardens and the two uh, extremely keen supervisors that we have on board at the moment uh, and then we talked about the impact of covid and the fact that uh, we have offered an extremely good service in kensington and chelsea we haven't shut down the noise and nuisance team for example as other london boroughs have uh, and they've worked very hard uh, to sort of be the front line reporting at weekends and at nights on the sort of lockdown across the boroughs. I think that's probably enough for you at the moment. Um, right, I've got um, no questions. I would first, well, maybe I'd like to say something myself. First of all, uh, having been involved as lead member went with uh, Crest One, um, thank you very much for that time. Um, and I presume that you're still, I mean, you made excellent progress in the face of COVID um, and adapted well. Um, presumably you're still facing some issues to do with um, coordination between different departments, data, um, who holds what files and processing power and back office and all of those sorts of things. OK, the challenge has been made easier with Power BI. So we have a database that we, I'd be happy to show, share the link with you and talk you through it. Uh, but we do collect data in real time now. As soon as it's added, it's on there. Um, so we can actually show a map of the borough 
show you where the hotspots are for the complaints across all the teams in the Crest family uh, and the the work that each team is doing on each case. You can see how long it's been open and what, what the case is about. The, the real challenge is the sort of physical things. So we're based in Pembroke Road, uh, but obviously not everyone's in because the um, the challenges of COVID-19, etc. So the front facing teams are there, uh, but the sort of management and support aren't always available, although they're obviously online or through this method, which does work. Uh, so we've got a rotation of people going in. But the actual data has been quite a success, and I, I, I think you'd be quite impressed. Uh, Jem Kamali has seen it, and you know he's impressed uh, with with what we can produce and and show. You know we we can show where the hotspots are. Uh, so each week we can task to those areas. So if if we know there's a trend, we can say, yeah, we will send officers there or concentrate resources at the weekend, for example, if we, we know something's going to be going on based either on history or intelligence received. Yeah, that, that sounds excellent news. And also it, it uh, by getting over that particular difficulty, it it would seem that that opens up the opportunity for doing the next phase and uh, later phases of integration of council's activities on the street. So I'm, I'm very glad that that's that, a bit of a breakthrough that because there was good work by officers before, but it was really hampered by the lack of a, a workable back office solution. So um, that's that's wonderful news. But the question I would like to ask is to uh, are we um, looking in the future um, beyond phase two uh, or two B um, to linking up uh, more with um, uh, customer services. All right, if you can hold one minute, let me just get rid of the dog, sorry. As a light-hearted interjection, at least he's not in the shower as a certain Spanish local authority official was apparently last week. I was, I was just saying while you were absent that there was a Spanish chap who left his camera on whilst he took a shower. Um, so yeah. I think this we're all beginning to learn what we mustn't do. Anyway, uh, uh, the question was as to whether in the future, uh, and I know it's not a, a, force, I mean, it's a short term, but uh, are you still conceptually try, aiming to try, try to draw together customer services and uh, the uh, Crest family? Yes, the um, we've had talks already. Uh, so, for example, part of the discussion has been using the Fix My Streets app or similar. Yeah, uh, they've made various sort of bits of progress in Westminster with this this system uh, as a direct comparison to Wandsworth, for example, that use it but don't integrate it. Uh, the, the challenge of the databases that we have and the company that owns the database and the plans they have going forward. So what we're hoping to do shortly is make the customer ability to put a complaint on through the report it forms shorter. So it's easier for them to, you know, report report the, um, the you know, whatever the matter is. Now the warden service will be trialing it because at the moment they're using the customer interface to report some of the issues they come across. And the feedback from them is the key. You know, they're using it all the time. And, the, you know, that we're waiting for, you know, one of them's already come out with one of the pages, for example, that doesn't need to be there because it asks the same question a bit later. So those yeah. are the things where we're going. Where we're going. I mean, may, maybe this is, uh, you know, grist the mill for a report in the future. But thank you for saying that the door is now open for that development. So that's, that's, that's brilliant news. Um, now, do we have any other questions? Um, Alison, I think you want to ask a question. Alison Jackson. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I think you've actually just covered it, but I was going to ask, is there a, just a very, very fast way of uh, visually video uh, and picture and text reporting of uh, an enforcement that, or an offence uh, that uh, shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be taking place immediately, that can be solved immediately? Okay, so the report it form can be used and you can attach a photograph to it. And then if officers are available in that area, it will go to them and they will deal with it. Uh, we still talk about having direct access to the 
the wardens, for example, by telephone, but that hasn't been resolved yet. Uh, but the, the by having more people around who know what each other's team does, even if the wrong enforcement officer turns up, they can still take action or take more evidence or mm. capture the mood and then report it back to the enforcing team. And by working out of Pembroke Road, you know, your, you know, the scenario that you come up with, there'll be someone talking to someone and, you know, in a very short time, things will be dealt with much more quickly. And so any resident can use that. And where, how will that be marketed? Right. So at the moment, I, that's a good question. We haven't, I, would, I can't answer that. And so we've got a scheme in place. The reporter is through the council's website at the moment. The uh, as we get the more wardens on board and we launch the warden service, we'll use that as an opportunity to explain to people how to complain about issues to the council. Uh, you know, the noise and nuisance team, for example, is already already very well established and is taking thirteen to fifteen thousand complaints a year, mm. and mostly out of hours. Um, and I, I hope we don't get that many complaints just for the wardens going forward. But we need to get people to know that they exist and that they can report issues. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Marwan, uh, Councillor Marwan El Ghani. Yes, not... um, Mr. Chair, thank you so much. Uh, so just a short question, just ensuring the, uh, the integrity of the system. When uh, somebody uh, uh, lodge a complaint, how do you ensure that uh, this is a real complaint being generated and, uh, and there is a, a, a safeguard against the uh, so-called uh, people who are uh, guilty. Uh, how, how do you ensure that uh, we don't, um, let's say, uh, uh, put, uh, um, what, uh, put a claim uh, that's a, a, of a nuisance against a person which is not really causing uh, a problem? But how, how, that's the, the insurance of the data being collected uh, originally. And how do you make sure that the quality of the complaint is uh, really um, uh, being dealt with? Thank you, okay. Mr. Chair. Uh, OK, there's two, two, two things. Um, it's a well-established principle that we have. For example, in the noise team, we use a very low-level letter if we can't witness the problem, we will send a, a letter to the person that's been complained about just to inform them there's been a complaint and if they could call us to discuss the matter. And, you know, if somebody has falsely been complained about, they ring us up and they tell us and we make a note of that and we don't take the matter any further. Uh, the key is to get an officer, it doesn't matter where from, to witness the problem that somebody has raised. Uh, we use officers' notes, we use officers' evidence when we go to court or if we serve an enforcement notice or a prohibition notice. Now, we don't use residents um, as the primary source of evidence. We might do as a backup, but that, that's extremely unusual. And we're very, very aware that there are people out there that will make unjustified, unnecessary complaints about other residents. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you answered my question. Thanks, Mr. Chair. That's a very, very good question. And uh, we've got no more questions on that item. So if we could move on to A9, um, I think I'm right in saying uh, short term lets. Uh, have I gone to the wrong one? No, I missed out our culture plan. Sorry, pardon me. Um, my mistake. Um, the uh, culture plan is uh, a difficult one for us today because we only received the um, full report this afternoon. Um, there was an outline on, there was a, there was a text version on Friday, um, which was also very late. It, it's very difficult for us because two things. First of all, it's an extremely important area in, in the borough um, and a large part of our, uh, the quality of our life and also employment and economic generation comes from culture in its broadest sense. Uh, community resilience and a whole number of other aspects of of our of our life. Um, so, uh, and there's also a key decision uh, which is coming up uh, soon. So, um, I think um, it's going to be. I, I will ask Terry Oliver in a minute to make a, a short presentation on this verbally, 
Um, but what I need also is advice from uh, officers as to how members of this committee, when they've had a time to read properly this excellent report um, and to come back with further questions and points. Um, so, um, and, and I mean, this is such a fast moving area. I mean, the government through, uh, I say through, announced 1.47 billion pounds into this field, uh, I think it was last night. Um, and uh, we've got the whole area of the high street economy, et cetera, um, and a very uh, high proportion of people who work in the borough um, are in this sort of broad field. So um, I don't know what the best, probably the best way to do this is if we could get Terry, if you could do a short uh, presentation for us and uh, try to identify the key areas where the, the key decision is going to be made, because that's this is going to be a long di discussion on culture. Uh, way beyond the key decision. But I think what this committee needs to know is what does it need to comment to focus on and comment on in the relation to the key decision? Okay, thank you, Councillor. Um, I think Emma, um, Councillor Will might want to come in actually. I've just seen the chat. So, yeah, Emma, do you want to? First, that's fine. You go first. Yeah, if I give you a little bit of the context. So, uh, firstly, apologies for the, the late paper it's um been quite a, a stressful time <laughs> on, on this um uh, producing this paper so the original plan um back in 2019 the council obviously produced the council plan where one of the five priorities was a a place of culture to visit and explore so the original intention was that we produce this culture plan that really sets out how we deliver that that priority and what we would originally intending was to have that that plan up and running in April of this year but as we were kind of getting to the end of the process of pulling that together and it involved a lot of um, consultation um, with residents businesses um, all the cultural institutions the creative sector um, we pulled together um, a draft um, culture plan which we were looking to get to a key decision or leadership team for approval in April but then obviously in March um, COVID-19 hit us and that's had a huge impact on the cultural sector and really changed the whole landscape um, so rather than plough on with the existing culture plan what we thought we would do is um, just reduce it down to a one-year plan where we're looking at how we can really address some of those issues that have come out of um, COVID-19 and how we can support the the creative sector within the borough and there's 55 actions that have been listed in um, the latest that one year plan. So it is only a one year plan. So there is a lot of opportunity to work with councillors um, on delivering that. And it is, we're quite happy to have some of those actions as um, the action plan as a live document as well. But we do want to look at um, moving forward once kind of the response to COVID has. Um, within the, the cultural sector has been kind of more decided and it's clearer, then we would look at producing a revised culture plan to um, build on that. But we've also got to look at kind of the emphasis and importance of diversity and equality as well within um, the culture plan. So that's what we've really tried to fo focus on is our response to COVID. So a lot of kind of digital um, online offer and also making sure that the cultural offer in the borough is actually representative of, of the people here as well. Thank you. Um, Emma, would you like to follow up with that? Yes, I just really wanted to um, reinforce what Terry said. And, and, and I, I, I'm sorry that you haven't had a chance to look at it because a huge amount of work has gone into this. But as Terry says, you know, uh, uh, the reality keeps overtaking us. Every time we think we're ready to publish, something happens and we, we find ourselves rewriting it. And in the end, we are only, it is only a one year document. Although there's a lot of actions, it is, you know, a fairly slim paper. The bigger paper will hopefully come next year the, when, when we're in a slightly clearer picture with COVID. But there are lots of good things in there. Um, I would love you all to look at it and feedback. 
Um, I, I, I hope you won't find it in any way controversial. And as I say, it's we, you know, even this morning, as Terry said, we've had this announcement of one and a half billion. So I almost already feel the paper's obsolete again <laughs> before we've even published it. So we just can't we can't change it fast enough at the moment. So um, but do all please look at it and, and, and feedback if you have any uh, thoughts or comments. Thank you. I think the, the, the key question that puzzled me a little bit, um, maybe I'm just being dim, was um, what in as uh, the key decision that's going to be taken um, in the near future uh, process starting tomorrow, I believe, is that the this plan is adopted for the next year. Is that that correct? Terry, do, shall I have? Uh, yes. Yeah, that is yes, basically. Yeah. That, so that, so that's so the, appro that the approval of the one year plan. Yeah. The one year plan with a budget yeah. attached to it. Yeah. Right. So, um, I, I mean, even if uh, individual members of this committee or the committee as a whole came up with some e enormous perceived heffalump tramp trap to do with one of the actions, uh, giving a general agreement to the or, or um, green flag or whatever it's called to the to the KD is is not going to be an objective. And what Terry's been saying, um, I understand that there's a deal of flexibility to receive comment even once the key decision is taken. It's not set in stone. These are 55 actions which, which constitute a plan, um, but it's a live document and, you know, all contributions with regard to, you know, good, bad and ugly, if you like, will be um, you know, taken on board in proportion as we go, because normally once a key decision is made, that's it. It's set in stone. Um, but I think what you're saying is it's slightly different in this instance. Absolutely. And in my introduction, I stress the fact that we are going to have to be flexible and adapt with this document because yep. we're just an unknown territory. Um, but, you know, there's I, I think um, so. Yeah, there's lots of potential and some of those actions will become more relevant and probably some of them less relevant. But, you know, we can't know that yet. And a bit like some of Johnny's experiments with his planning and, and transport things, some of these things will work brilliantly and some won't work so well. And you'll curtail them and you'll build on the ones that work well. Exactly. Right. OK, well, I think it, with that with that sentiment, um, what we're saying, therefore, is could members of this committee please take the opportunity of reading this excellent report? Could they pick up on areas which they have ind individual knowledge about i mean they'll, they, a lot of this is geographically dispersed so different members of this committee will have more or less knowledge depending on where they live or are ward councillors um and give comment back to emma and terry as soon as possible um but also um it, you know we'll engage it would be good to get a, a bit of an update on this as you work through it i don't know whether our next meeting or the one after would be more appropriate um, but um, you'll probably both be at the next meeting anyway. So even if it was a minor item or a major item on the agenda, we can adjust accordingly. But it's a sort of work in progress, although we're agreeing to it now, if that's what people are happy to do. <coughs> happy to do. Um, Portia, uh, thanks. Uh, you said love the photographs displayed. That's a comment. That's not a question. So I'll take that on board. And I think um, <coughs> if anybody's not seeing the chat, uh, Councillor Thaxter has just said, love the photographs displayed, which I think we'd all agree with. There's a, there's a lot of excellent photographs in there. Um, so with that, if we could um, move. Alison, have you got any comment you want to make here? Um, yes, uh, absolutely. But I would rather sort of stop because I think I'd like to read the new document before I make any Good comment. Point. Comments. Okay, well, let, let's let's take it as that. I know you're a great enthusiast in this area, so if you um, are going to read it thoroughly and and make a, some good comments, if you can make sure that that I'm copied in as well, that would be excellent news. Yeah. Um, if on that basis we could move on to a nine um, short-term holiday lets. Now, um, this is a working group that's uh, completed its work. Um, and it, the report was published um, quite a long time ago. Um, A9 is an update um, on the implementation of those recommendations. And having read it, my um, take from it was that there's still the issue of policing and working with the providers 
of uh, these short-term lists in practical ways to ensure that we still get a viable policing exercise. So if I could ask John Wade to discuss the paper. This is by way of information, this paper, more than anything else. Uh, yes, Councillor Pascal. As, as you've said, uh, a previous uh, reincarnation of the Environment Select Committee Public Realm Scrutiny Group set up a, a working par party back on this in uh, 2018, and it reported to to the council in 20 uh, March 2018 with a number of recommendations. So, as you've said, this is a report. This is an update to to where we've we've got to um, in in terms of short term holiday lettings. Um, now, there's obviously a number of strands for this. So there's two principal ones. There's the one that I'm really involved in, which is the planning strand to this. And then there's the other strand, which is more to do with uh, amenity and health and safety. Um, I'm, I, could, I, will, um, I, I could give you an update on, on, on amenity, health and safety, but I'm not probably quite so qualified on that. But what I put in the report, um, uh, clearly, if there are any questions, I, I will do my best to... Uh, to answer them. If I'm not able to answer them, then I, I will go back to Stuart Priestley, who I'm sure will will provide those answers. Um, just briefly, in terms of planning, um, we, we have concerns regarding short-term holiday lets because there is a change of use um, uh, that occurs uh, with, with these if they go over the 90 days and they basically change from permanent residential accommodation in planning terms to, to, a, to a commercial uh, sui generis use, uh, but it means that you know if 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 the use is not controlled over over a period of time, and, and it is quite a long period of time, um, then eventually you could apply for what's called a certificate of ex lawful existing use, and 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 if you've got the evidence there, then the count the the, the local planning authority have no choice but to to, to grant. The certificate. So um, this is not just a, a problem with us, it's a problem throughout uh, many other London boroughs and as you can see in the report uh, mm -hmm. we have met other London boroughs um, yeah. to, to discuss this issue. Um, just in terms of planning enforcement it's been difficult to enforce. We don't know when people go over the 90 days in any calendar year um, and where we have tried to enforce, it's been very difficult to do so because of the evidence that we would need that the um, that the 90 day rules actually been breached. Um, so the, 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 the system is probably not as good as it, we feel it should be. And if we felt and so one of the things we've been lobbying for is, 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 a, is a light touch registration scheme, because that would allow not only um, for us to to monitor these uh, in planning terms, but it would also allow colleagues with, within uh, other departments, particularly to do with noise and nuisance, environmental health and um, waste, to, uh, to, to be aware of where uh, these properties actually are. What we have done, um, and it says in the report, uh, we uh, a, a dedicated web page has been set up to deal with short-term lets. So that does provide uh, best practice uh, about um, if you are letting out a property. And it also provides um, a link uh, to um, our, our, um, the, the planning enforcement team or the, the noise and nuisance team um, if, if um, neighbours are concerned that, that uh, there's either a problem uh, with noise and nuisance or amenity or there's, the, there's other problems that are, are being caused by these LEDs. So, as I said, this is really just a, an update of where we are. I think it's fair to say at the moment during lockdown, clearly uh, visitors coming into the borough, large numbers of visitors coming into the borough is clearly not an issue at the moment. I suppose it remains to be seen now that we have been there, uh, you know, in lockdown and businesses are struggling to, to recover, how much traction this might have with the government in the future. Um, ironically, um, probably the planning clock has now been reset because one would have thought that the visitor to accommodation that was out there, even if it had been let in excess of the 90 days, uh, probably isn't being let at the moment. But that's only a guess. Um, so it's not really a pressing issue, I don't think, at the moment. It's unlikely to be, given the fact that there's probably not a lot of visitors around. 
Um, clearly, as things change and things pick up, I imagine it will become more of an issue. Uh, but at the moment, this is this paper is really just giving an update on the existing situation. Um, could I uh, suggest, therefore, that um, we ask uh, officers supporting this committee to um, make inquiries in, say, two months' time as to whether there is any change in these surrounding circumstances? Because I think what you're saying, uh, Jonathan, is that when uh, the economy uh, has an uptick, hopefully, um, that that we will we may see a reversion to problems as previous and we may not and that that will decide the urgency of further work on this area but some of what's in the report strikes me as rather long-term lobbying um and um you know i i don't know whether you're continuing work on that but i mean what i'm trying to grasp here is that this is in effect a piece of work which the scrutiny is completed this is an update on what there's been as a result of work by officers which is excellent has been disrupted by covid as many things have been uh do we need to return to have a, an update report on this in the future or not maybe we hold that as a question for officers to check with you at a later date um from my perspective i think that's absolutely right i mean we we, we clearly don't know you know whether the effects that we were get, we were experiencing uh, before the pandemic will will come back and um, clearly uh, I think any prediction would be that um, to go back to sort of visitors um, you know coming into the borough and using short-term lets we, we, we're clearly some months it may be even more than a year away or more uh, about before going back to those sort of levels so I think it is a case of just continuing to monitor and to see whether at some point you know, we feel this is becoming more of a problem again. Yeah, or it could happen for a different reason. I've heard some anecdotal evidence of people who are trying to work to move closer into to town uh, on uh, partial week uh, occupancy uh, because they're working from home and they don't want to use the tube transport from their temporary arrangement in town into their office. So there are all sorts of strange results from COVID that could, might, might not, in, and the volumes also is another aspect you're saying. But, but if we could leave it with um, uh, Jackie and uh, other officers to question you in, shall we say, a couple of months' time as to whether this is something that we all need an update next committee or later on in the year. But if we could have it on a checklist, that would be very useful. Um, thank you very much for that. Uh, final item we've got on the agenda tonight is the uh, work programme. Now, I, I don't intend to... Uh, for us to have a large, uh, a long discussion, bearing in mind the time, nine o'clock, but also um, I think this is something that's more of a, a starting of a discussion. Um, uh, Councillor Rossi and uh, Jackie Hurd have indicated to me that there's a discussion over the next couple of months at least for us to start developing our work programme for the next year. So what I'm calling on an, uh, our committee members to do is if they could email in to, uh, to, to Jackie and myself uh, the suggestions that they feel uh, that they wish to have considered as items for working going forward, that we will pull together in a list which will then be discussed with other select committee chairs and Councillor Rossi as chair of the OSC in terms of developing a, a program going forward. Um, my initial thoughts are that uh, the ULES work should become subsidiary to the SSB work because there are so many areas like that which are important and interesting in their own right and have little uh, knotty problems associated with them because I think, for instance, that ULES, one of the things that's got to be addressed is how poor care workers who have basic cars that they can't afford to replace are going to do their care work or their, their voluntary sector work without and without having to pay the uh, fairly uh, large daily charges. Um, I think the housing modular uh, group has, has, with excellent support from, from Ryan, um, really reached a conclusion that it's uh, 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 there are advantages in housing um, uh, provision, but not perhaps in the borough, um, but the general 
question of how we can improve the delivery of housing, which is of joint interest to this committee and also the housing uh, housing committee, is something that I intend to um, discuss with the chair Kasimali of, of that that uh, committee uh, as to whether what he's what he's looking at his priorities. So we put that into the pot jointly there. Um, I think the ESSB progress uh, and the CREST progress um, and the consultation on planning um, the pillar planning uh, the pass review are all things that need to be considered. Now they don't have to be considered for working groups necessarily. They might be considered as needing further update reports from officers. So if if you could add your suggestions, my fellow committee members, to that list, initial list, uh, I would very much welcome it. Um, does anybody want to raise a particular point under that at the moment? No, don't have any questions or hands raised. So I would like to thank everybody for tonight. Uh, unless there are any other non, um, uh, any urgent business items under A11, I would like to close the meeting and thank you all very much at 21.03. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.